Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. For years, and this has been going on a long time, it's consistent, we've heard supporters of unilateral executive power over war tell us that Thomas Jefferson's response to the conflict with the Barbary pirates supports their position. But they're either ignorant of about 90% of the history, maybe even more, or they're just flat out lying. So I'm going to set the record straight and give you guys an overview of what exactly happened in the first Barbary War and actually the years leading up to it. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We have a bunch of live streaming channels on video, YouTube, Periscope, DLive, Twitch, and Facebook. We also have archived editions at brighteon.com, bittubers.com, and bitshoot.com. Plus, we also have the audio-only podcast edition where I've been seeing more and more reviews coming in on iTunes, uh, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, and elsewhere. Basically, find all the ways to follow us, to support us, uh, to find all of our archives, links that I mentioned in the show notes. Basically, you're just going to go over to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Saying hello to some people over in the live chat. I'm very grateful for everyone who joins me for the live show. But if you don't make it to the live show, that's cool, too. I appreciate everyone who visits, listens, or watches, or comments, shares their thoughts in the archives as well. Hi, uh, Essential Freedom. Keith the Hat Guy, Andrew Nappy, Justin Bayola, Heather Rossi, Tyler B., Christopher Hall, Michael Bogus, and Dan Warsaw, and everybody else. I know I'm missing a few people, but I'm very grateful for you spending a little time with me today. So let's start setting the record straight on the Constitution and war powers and this story about Jefferson and the Barbary Pirates. Mind you, I don't even honestly know where this all comes from. But one of the most common responses that we get to pointing out that Congress and not the president has the power to decide the question of peace or war. In fact, we actually got this just as an email last night as I was going through my notes for this. Oh, an email from a guy named Larry came in and he put it this way, quote, how do you define Thomas Jefferson's actions against the pirates along the Barbary Coast? I don't think he had congressional approval. So they believe from somewhere, they believe that Thomas Jefferson engaged in military action against the Barbary states without a declaration of war. And so then what follows, and not necessarily that Larry was saying this, but what follows is that, well, if even Jefferson did it, then presidents today can absolutely do it. But the fact is this one sentence boiling down what actually was well over 20 years of history there into one sentence is totally wrong. So let's get into this. First of all, we're going to start from Monticello.org, their page. They've got a really, I'm going to put these links in the show notes again, 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. I'm just giving you really the brief story here, the brief history in this episode. And if you really want to read in more detail, there's a lot of juicy tidbits. If you want to geek out on this, uh, we've got uh, Monticello.org. We've got an article that I'm going to cover from Dave Benner here at 10th Amendment Center, who does great work. He's got an awesome book, or I think he's got a new one coming out as well. Plus, Tom Woods, we've got an article from him that covers this, too. So let's start out at Monticello.org. This is Jefferson's estate, their website. And this is how they put it. When Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated in March of 1801, he inherited troubled relations with the Barbary states. And I guess that's a bit of an understatement, but troubled relations. The Ottoman regencies of Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, along with independent Morocco. So the Barbary... Pirates really were more than just a bunch of people with, uh, you know, the way we think of pirates, a bunch of people with ships. They actually, they were states, but they acted like pirates. They were corsairs. Now, Monticello actually thinks pirate is the incorrect term, but Jefferson himself referred to this, them as pirates. I believe James Madison, as Secretary of State, also called them pirates. So I'm okay with, if, if Jefferson and Madison called them that, let's call them pirates. So Monticello goes on. The United States had treaties with all four, but tension was high and rising. 
in 1784, we got to go all the way back to 1784. Congress at that time, this is before the Constitution was ratified, so they were operating under the Articles of Confederation, they had appointed Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin as peace commissioners. Jefferson was involved in this effort for almost 20 years before he even took office. So he knew full well exactly what was going on. But they went as peace commissioners to negotiate treaties of amity and commerce with the principal states of Europe and the Mediterranean, including the Barbary states. So they they sent out three, three of their top guys, most well-known people, out to uh, create treaties. But then they quickly learned that the Europeans made tr peace, and this is again from Monticello.org, that Europeans made peace with the Barbary powers through treaties that involved annual payments of tribute, sometimes euphemistically called annuities. So they were really paying bribes. This was the common accepted practice among the European powers. I mean, I'm sure there were some that didn't do this because they had a strong enough navy to deal with it, but it was a commonly accepted practice that basically if you didn't pay off these Barbary states, they were going to raid you. They, these Corsairs were going to raid you, steal your stuff, sell it off, and that's how they were going to earn a living. It's a horrible, I mean, I think a lot of countries act like that today. Some of them might be very familiar. Going on, in 1784, Thomas Jefferson doubted the American people would be willing to pay annual tribute. They didn't have a lot of money. They had a lot of financial difficulties. In fact, when he took office in 1801, one of his biggest things was to pay down the debt. And he said this, would it not be better to offer them an equal treaty? Let's offer them peace. And if they refuse... Why not go to war with them? So all the way back to 1784, Jefferson was thinking this might lead to war. Because if you get into a situation where you're basically paying ransom, we can call them annuities or payments of tribute, but it's really just ransom. If you get into a situation where you pay people ransom, we can call them terrorists, we can call them pirates. This is going to encourage them to do more. And Jefferson didn't think that was a really good uh, approach, that the American people wouldn't really be on board with this, especially after they just finished fighting off the greatest empire in the history of the world at that time. So a month after this, he learned that a, a small American brig had been seized by a Moroccan corsair in the Atlantic, and he emphasized this hard line, quote, our trade to Portugal, Spain, and the Mediterranean is annihilated unless we do something decisive. Tribute or war is the usual alternative of these pirates. If we yield the former, it will require sums which our people will feel. And that's just being diplomatic. In other words, sums that they don't want to have to pay, it's going to hurt. So why not begin a navy then and decide on war? We cannot begin in a better cause nor against a weaker foe. So they didn't have a Navy at this time. In fact, the Navy really wasn't authorized until, I believe, 1798, where they authorized, I think, six frigates. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But there was no Navy. And Jefferson's saying, look, we can't just live like this forever. If we're going to be an independent country, we're going to have to be able to defend ourselves. So instead of paying off this tribute, why don't we just start building a Navy? And then these this foe is very weak. Let's deal with it later. Let's build up to that over time. So from there, let's go a little further from Monticello. So Congress at that point, they did decide, they wrote, that peace was to be bought. They authorized $80,000 for negotiations. The commissioners sent American consul Thomas Barclay. I wonder if he's related to the Barclays Bank of these days. I'm not sure. Thomas Barclay to Morocco and Connecticut Sea Captain John Lamb to Algiers. Now, Barclay was successful. They had a draft treaty that they sent out and was accepted. Jefferson, Adams, and Congress were very satisfied with that, but the equal treaty did not work out well in other places like Algiers. They say Algiers was much more dependent than Morocco on the fruits of corsairing, captured goods, slaves, the ransom they brought, and tribute, and was less amenable to a peace treaty with the United States. So that was the Lamb mission. That failed. Jefferson continued, even after that in 1786, after working on this for nearly two years, he continued to make negotiations with the Bay of Algiers. They put it day. It's actually the Bay, B-E-Y of Algiers, both from Paris and later as Secretary of State under President Washington. So Jefferson kept pushing for this. But... Over a period of few months, in 1793, 
the Algerian Corsairs seized 11 merchant vessels, at least 10 of them in the, in the Atlantic, with over 100 crewmen and passengers. Now, he was no longer Secretary of State. By 1795, America did actually make peace, but they did it through paying ransom, that Jefferson actually said, we shouldn't do this. We really shouldn't. Now, don't think that he never thought that maybe you should do it, because at some point, even during his presidency, he went to discuss this with his cabinet, that, well, maybe in this situation we should at least consider it. He didn't rule it off the table all the time and said it was either our way or war. He never went to that. But he really thought it was a bad idea to pay ransom, tribute, annuities, whatever you call it, because it does. I think this is a pretty smart dude. We should maybe listen to his approach. And I think a lot of people probably agree with this general principle today. So they did pay this. And that amount over years was a million bucks. And this is how Dave Benner put it in his great article. He said, for his part, Jefferson believed that capitulating to the demands of the pirates would simply encourage future kidnappings and advised against making the payments. However, they were in no position. The U.S. was in no position. There was no Navy. They had no way to defend it. They had to rely. At some point, they got some support from the French. Uh, the British weren't helping them anymore, obviously. So American merchant vessels were really sitting ducks. So strained by the debt from the war with Britain, the United States, Dave writes, continued to pay the $1 million figure for the next 15 years. That's a huge, huge amount of money. Now, just before Jefferson took office, it started to ramp up again. So they started to pay this over a period of like five, six years or so. But in October of 1800, back to Monticello.org, five months before Jefferson took office, the American consul in Tripoli, this is James Cathcart, he summarized the long rambling messages that he had been sending the Secretary of State and others for a year or more. And this was the Pasha's message, according to to the American consul in Tripoli, today's Libya. If you don't give me a present, this is the, the language they use to me is in a way entertaining. It's very interesting, but I think it's also very, we can really understand what was going on. If you don't give me a president, the Pasha of Tripoli said, I will forge a pretext to capture your defenseless merchantmen. He likewise says that he expects an answer as soon as possible and that any delay on our side, will only serve to injure our interests. So the Pasha is basically making threats, saying, look, you guys got to give me some cash. This is how we do things around here. And Jefferson, we know, wasn't on board with this. Adams was, I think, a little back and forth. I don't really know the history of John Adams on this as much as I should, but I will research that a little bit more in case you guys have some questions. Or if you guys have some insight, I know people like Richard Kramer, uh, who watch the show really regularly, always <laughs> has some really good comments. So if anybody has some uh, in insight on that as well or some suggested reading, I'd be happy to take a look. Now, a week after this letter was written, this is October 1800, the Tripoli Corsairs took captured an, they captured an American brig, the Catherine. But the Pasha said, no, 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 we got to give them time to respond. Even then, these terrorists, pirates, etc. said, you know, we gave them a chance. Let's give them a chance. We're going to give them time to actually respond. And this is what he actually said. Quote, before he would take any measures whatsoever against the United States, he would wait for the president's letter, answer to his letter of five months earlier. That was May of 1800. <clears throat> and then he had another meeting with Cathcart. Just I, this is really important. I'm sorry if any of it's boring, but it's important to set the stage. So the Pasha then had another meeting and said, OK, we'll wait another six months to see how you guys do. So October, November, December, January, February, March to April. He said he would wait till April, basically, at this point. Maybe it was May, because this was a letter of October uh, 1800 or so. We're going to give you another six months. And he said that if he did not get a satisfactory response or any reply, basically says if he did not get an acceptable reply, the Pasha would declare war on the United States. Here's what it says. He would declare war on the United States if the answer did not arrive in that time or was unsatisfactory. So we're already told, we already know that this story that Jefferson engaged in hostilities against another country without a declaration from war from Congress, we already know it's false because we're getting threats to declare war this way. I mean, you can't just take 
what Jefferson did in isolation and not pay attention to what the other side did. Unsurprisingly, so by that time, they had six frigates. Like I said, they authorized them in 1798. So when Jefferson took office, Congress had already passed legislation. And this was, I believe, this is also from Dave Benner's article. Congress had passed naval legislation that authorized the ships to, quote, protect our commerce and chastise their insolence by sinking, burning, or destroying their ships and vessels wherever you shall find them. They didn't say, dear president, like in authoriz authorizations to use military force today, AUMF. They didn't say, you determine, you determine who and when and where. They basically said, look, if anyone attacks our ships, you burn, sink, or destroy them. So Jefferson refused. Once he took office in March, he refused to pay Tripoli's new demand of $225,000. This is a huge amount at that point. And as Dave put it, then tensions flared. Jefferson sent three frigates and one schooner, schooner under the command of Commodore Richard Dale to attempt to maintain peace and engage in diplomacy with the Barbary state. Some people think he just sent them there to engage in conflict, but that is nonsense. There was actually more stuff behind the scenes that people who don't read history actually happen. Dave goes on. He says, Dale was instructed to protect the ships and their crew from hostility by taking responsive action against the pirates. But what happened when the ships went? He would also deliver, he was instructed to deliver a letter, this is from Monticello.org, to the Pasha, and he said, and if still at peace, could then give Cathcart money for a gift to the Pasha. Basically, Jefferson was kind of ready to capitulate, at least to some degree there, not to $225,000, but at some point, he was willing to say, look, if we're still at peace at this point, when you guys get there, we'll give a little cash and, and let's figure this out, a gift. Jefferson's letter to Pasha Karamanli. I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly. I'm not sure if any of his relatives are alive today, but I'm doing my best. Emphasized, quote, our sincere desire to cultivate peace and commerce with your subjects. So even under all of this conflict, after Jefferson being involved in this for about 17 years, now when he went as an embassy or as a commissioner to, uh, to uh, generate peace treaties, it's not like he only knew of the history starting in 1784. I think at least from what they say at Monticello.org, they did learn on that mission that this was the general process. But they certainly knew that there were issues with these states even before 1784. So Jefferson, a student of history and personally living through a lot of this, he still, even through all of this, still sent a letter. Look, we're trying to cultivate peace. He didn't block him from having a meeting. He didn't stop communication with him like they've been doing for so many decades today. He still said, look, let's have peace. Give him a chance. We're not going to necessarily go to war with you. Let's give you another chance. Also mentioned in the letter was our dispatch to the Mediterranean of a squadron of observation. That was, I think, a very diplomatic political way of saying, look, we want peace, but we've got some people there to watch that can take care of business if needed. He says, whose appearance we hope will give umbrage to no power. And here's what James Madison had to say at the same time. He wrote American consuls in the Mediterranean that the president convinced, quote, of the hostile purposes of the Bashaw of Tripoli was sending a naval squadron to protect our commerce in the Mediterranean and to respond appropriately to any powers who declared war on the United States. Now, mind you, a declaration of war, again, does not necessarily mean a piece of paper that says, we are declaring war against you. Under the founders' understanding, what was ratified, war is declared when there's actions that create a war. So uh, there could be an attack. I would say at some point there was already some type of war going on here. <clears throat> So he said, look, we're, we're ready to deal with this. We're going to take care of you if we need to. We're even going to, they were ready to actually even do a little bit of a capitulation, it looked like. Uh, but they found out when they got there that war had already been declared. So they got there sometime, I think, in June of 1801. Jefferson took over in March of that year. But Pasha Yusuf Karamanli of Tripoli declared war on the United States on May 14th, 1801. That in and of itself 
100, all we need is this entire episode could be boiled down to that one particular line. Jefferson absolutely did not go and engage in military conflict with another country and ignore the restrictions in the Constitution on the power to declare war, to engage in hostilities, to change the state of the nation from peace to war. Because war was declared on the United States. Dave goes on. Using the power that was author already authorized by Congress, Jefferson was steadfast in his pledge to demonstrate America's commitment in the matter. Still, he pledged that he was, and this is Jefferson's quote, even after war had been officially declared on the United States, he said, quote, he was unauthorized by the Constitution without the sanction of Congress to go beyond the line of defense. This is actually goes further than my view on this, because I've always taken the position, and I think I probably covered this in a number of episodes over the last uh, almost, I guess, year and a half or almost two years now as we're doing this. I've covered this a number of times where my view is once they declare war on you through an action, either through a statement or through bombing you, whatever, you can take all kinds of actions in response. Jefferson disagreed with that. He still thought in this particular situation, at least, that even after the war was declared, his job was only to hold the line of defense, basically repel attacks, fight back, sink ships that were committing acts of violence against Americans, not preemptively attack them, not invade, not occupy, not commit assassinates, assassinations, not go after the Pasha himself. He's sending letters to the guy. We want peace. So Jefferson specifically is even saying he's being more hardcore than I am, and that should make me rethink this. I should look a little bit more into it, because Jefferson's saying even in this situation, he was still unauthorized by the Constitution without the sanction of Congress to go beyond the line of defense. And here's what Tom Wood put in a great article that we published. He wrote this years ago, but we republished it a couple of times. I posted it on our Twitter account and other social media channels recently. This is how Tom puts it. Jefferson consistently deferred to Congress in his dealings with the Barbary pirates. There was conflict going on back and forth for years. And then even after Jefferson took, took office, there was still battles happening. There was a war going on. Literal war, not just talk, not just little minor skirmishes. There were actual battles that were happening. But he kept deferring to Congress. And Lewis Fisher, who is probably one of the great, greatest historians of war powers on the face of the earth, he put it this way. In fact, in at least 10 statutes, Congress explicitly authorized military action by Presidents Jefferson and Madison. So, he didn't just say this is what he was supposed to do, and then once there was a war declared against the United States, he just threw it out the window and said, well, now they attacked us, I can do whatever I want. He kept coming back to Congress for authority to do certain things. For example, Congress passed legislation in 1802 to authorize the president to equip armed vessels to protect commerce and seamen in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean and adjoining seas. The statute authorized American ships to seize vessels belonging to the Bay of Tripoli. He asked for permission to do this with the captured property distributed to those who brought the vessels into port. This is basically like a letter of mark and reprisal, something that should be used today. And further, additional legislation in 1804 gave explicit support for, quote, warlike operations against the Regency of Tripoli or any other of the Barbary powers. So he kept going back. Madison as well, 10, at least 10 different con congressional statutes. So Jefferson, for his part, for his experience in this, all kinds of back and forth, battles from the time he took office until the whole thing was resolved in 1805. And just as a quick aside, I think this is an interesting piece in history. Here from Wikipedia, they say the turning point in the war was the Battle of Derna. For those of you who don't know this, I think you'll find this interesting. Ex-Consul William Eaton, a former Army captain who used the title of General and U.S. Marine Corps First Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon, led a force of eight U.S. Marines, just merely eight U.S. Marines, and 500 mercenaries on a march across the desert from Alexandria, Egypt, to capture the Tripoli 
Leighton City, Triple Leighton City of Derna. This was the first time the U.S. Ra flag was raised in victory on foreign soil ever. The action is mem memorialized in a line of the Marines hymn, The Shores of Tripoli. The capturing of the city gave American no negotiators leverage in securing the return of hostages and the end of the war. So some people attacked Jefferson for his approach. Hamilton, for example, wrote Alexander Hamilton, who was retired at that point, wasn't shot dead yet either. But Alexander Hamilton, because he died in a duel uh, with Aaron Burr, but he attacked Thomas Jefferson for being weak. But Jefferson all along was saying, like, right from the beginning, Jefferson was saying, look, we should just ignore these requests and just set it up. We'll offer him peace and then we'll go to war if necessary. But when the time came, he knew that he still had to follow the Constitution. And as a strict constitutionalist, even in this scenario where violence was being committed against U.S. interests, he still continually went to Congress for authorization to do stuff. And then they finally were able to create a scenario where Tripoli had to back down. And I will put this link in the show notes as well. It's just an interesting document. There's an actual treaty, a treaty of peace and amity signed at Tripoli on June 4th, 1805. So they actually had a peace treaty with pirates. That means it can be done again today. So if we're taking the view that if Jefferson did it, then I think if Jefferson did it means you always defer to Congress on matters of peace and war. You don't let Congress actually dictate every single action, but you stick to the line of defense. And as Jefferson himself put it, Congress alone is constitutionally invested with the power of changing our condition from peace to war. So the short version, the short version is that Thomas Jefferson didn't just engage in war operations just on his own without an authorization from Congress, without a, a declaration of war against the United States in the first place. And he went to Congress at least 10 different times. This is totally different from how every president, doesn't matter which political party, every president has approached it in our lifetime. This idea that Congress waged war without authorization is a total lie. And mind you, this whole idea that someone else did it. Oh, my friend Joey did it. That's the arguments I gave my mother when I was six. And my mother was one of those ladies, or she is, I shouldn't say was, she's still alive. I talked to her a few days ago. So my mother, as she was raising me, she always had this look. I don't know if you guys had these types of mothers, but she gave me a look and that type of so-and-so did it so I can do it mentality went away real quick. I think if I even mentioned something like that, I was in fear of being grounded. This is the argument of a, a little kid. Yet this is one of the most common constitutional arguments about, uh, about the Constitution and war powers that we hear today. But Jefferson did it. We often hear, but Obama did it. You don't ever want to say, but Obama did it for sure. I mean, at least, but Jefferson did it, then you're at least looking to a constitutional List. If you look to someone like Barack Obama, then you're looking at one of the worst presidents in history. And now, mind you, let's say everything I'm telling you is a complete and utter lie. I'm making this all up. I didn't write this. None of these documents exist that show that any of this stuff happened. There was no declaration of war, and Jefferson just went in there and did this on his own. Let's say that's the case. But the Constitution remains the law of the land even if a president violates it and every president violates it for two centuries. The Constitution is the law, whether it's been ignored and no matter how many presidents violate it. And again, as Jefferson put it, I've got it up on the screen. It's Congress alone that is invested with this power. Looking over at the live chat, <clears throat> Jake Wishart said, wasn't the war against the Barbary pirates fought to free white slaves in Tripoli? No. Uh, the whole thing was about trying to extract a ransom and the U.S. not wanting to participate and kind of participating and encouraging them and the fact that the European powers participate. These are just pirates. I think there's no, no better way to put it. Season of the Witch says, I in no way want to subvert, subvert our Constitution. However, with the current state of our government's lawlessness, I am at a loss and not astute in constitutional law. I think many of us really have spent so many years 
in government run schools. I'm not sure where this whole notion that Jefferson did this came from, at least in Woods's article. Let me see if I see here. Recent. St this is what it is. Lewis Fisher put it this way. Recent studies by the Justice Department and statements made during congressional debate imply that Jefferson took military measures against the Barbary powers without seeking the approval or authority of Congress. So the Justice Department put this information out there, lied about it. It's not like they didn't have this access to this information. And debates in Congress said Jefferson did this. So now it's just kind of part of the ethos. A lot of people just believe this reflexively. Now, many people have never heard of this, but people who have, we almost never hear anything other than, well, Jefferson did it. Bob Brewer, good to see you. Every candidate should have a trembling fear of God and, of course, the people. I would agree. I added the of the people. Michael White says, this is not at all boring. I find it fascinating. I do as well, and I'm grateful for you saying that. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. But Congress is useless, says Season of the Witch. Any other way? Well, that's a different issue. Yes, Congress is evil. I'm not claiming that because the Constitution delegates a power to Congress that Congress is like a bunch of good guys. Congress is filled with evil Constitution and liberty-hating representatives. They're terrible. I really can't think of anybody who's consistently right on the Constitution and liberty all the time. I mean, I'm not, so why would they be? They have an interest in generating more power and keeping the status quo. So I tweeted the other day, maybe it was yesterday, so this whole war powers resolution coming from Pelosi and the Democrats, look, this is going to be garbage too. These people did not oppose what was going on when it happened in Libya, again, in Tripoli after all these years when the previous president was in office. And the way that at least I'm reading what they're proposing so far is that it's going to be garbage as well. It isn't actually following the Constitution. These people cannot be trusted. But the fact that they're bad does not mean you ignore the Constitution to get what you want. Because as George Washington warned us, as John Dickinson warned us, Thomas Jefferson and many others, Washington specifically said, ignoring, using usurpation, let there be no change of the Constitution by usurpation, by taking power that wasn't delegated to the, gov to the government, because this is the way that all free governments are destroyed. So if Washington suggested that, I think I'm going to be comfortable being on his side. J.T. Jackson Listening, like intense history, there's so much wisdom in history and insight, not boring. Great, great. I, you know, I, sometimes I really don't know. I, I try to have some fun and exciting episodes, and I'm not sure if some of this nitty-gritty detail is interesting to you guys, but I will always continue going back to it from time to time, and I'm glad that some people appreciate this. Dennis Marburger Dave Bar says, D Dave Benner's work on this topic is outstanding. I did a video maybe two years ago, like two minutes shortly covering Dave's work. Of course, I will link that article in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. To uh, You can find all the links. That'll be published in about a half hour to an hour as we wrap up the show. Anyways, I hope you guys found this interesting. It seems like some of you at least did. I hope you learned something. And even if you didn't learn something brand new, hopefully it just kind of got a light bulb going and got you to think about this whole thing a little bit differently or just put a little bit more thought to it. It's an incredibly important issue, and this is one of the most commonly cited examples for unilateral executive war power. And I think we need to forcefully point out that the narrative that we're being fed on this story as well, like so many others, is propaganda. It's bullcrap. It's a total lie. So hopefully this will provide or act as an interest resource for you in the future, and I'll make sure you have all the links that you need. If you support the show, make sure to smash that like button, continue leaving comments, share the link. If you've got some ideas for a future show, feel free to email me, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. Of course, that's all spelled out. And if you want to really want to kick in, support us financially, as little as two bucks a month goes a long, long way. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. And once you go to that link, you'll also be able to dig up if you're watching the video. I guess if you're listening as well, I've got this pretty cool Jefferson t-shirt that I'm wearing here as well. If you want to pick up one of these shirts, that all helps us out. Again, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for watching. I'm very grateful for you spending some time with me. I hope you have an awesome day and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.